Matthew chapter number 13. The book of Matthew is a very unusual chapter. Or book, chapter 13 of the book of Matthew is very unusual. In the fact, the entire chapter, the Lord Jesus is teaching using parables. A parable is an earthly story with a hidden heavenly meaning. And he gave several parables in this chapter, and then he gave the meanings thereof. And uh, he expounded on them, and he gave some insight to heavenly things uh, uh, based on natural courses or natural events or natural things. Uh, and uh, the Lord Jesus uh, could do that so practically and uh, drive home a point, and yet uh, uh, people whose desires were carnal never got it. But if you would just l listen with your heart, the Lord could help you with so many things. So uh, Matthew chapter 13, we'll begin reading verse 24. We're going to uh, read this parable. And verse 24 says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, I'm thankful for that things are different after we got saved. Lord, if they're not different, we didn't need a Savior. And Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, you came to save us and change us. And Lord, I'm looking for that heavenly change when, Lord, we put off this old body of clay. And Lord, we're granted a body fashioned under like the Son of God's uh, Lord, uh, John said, we don't know what we shall be, but we know when you shall appear, we shall be like you, for we shall see you as you are. And Lord, we're looking forward to those days. Until then, help us, Lord, to live as unto Christ and help us to make a difference in uh, the lives of others that they might see what a difference you've made in our life. Now, bless now, speak to every heart, encourage us in the things of God, enlighten our minds, uh, Give us understanding and wisdom. Lord, help us, uh, Lord, to receive the word of God with gladness and help us, Lord, to use it to not only better our lives, but use it that it might bring forth fruit in the lives of others. Uh, bless now as uh, only you can and will not fail to give you the praise for it. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, now, I have kind of rushed through the service to this point because I knew... Uh, that I have quite a bit to throw out there tonight. This is a Thad Abbott introduction for you uh, that need a little explanation. But when the Lord gives so much in the context that you've got to share it, we don't want to leave anything undone. And so I want you to notice a few things about this wonderful parable. The first thing I want you to notice is the work. Uh, we find in verse 24, the Bible says, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed. Uh, can I say you'll never have a harvest uh, unless you sow some seed. Uh, and you'll never ever build anything for God unless you work. Uh, now listen, uh, we're not saved by works, uh, but because I am saved, I have a desire to work for Jesus. Uh, 
I realize the only thing that's ever going to matter are those things that I've done for Jesus uh, and I've done in accordance to the will of Jesus. Uh, and can I say that the Lord Jesus has called us all uh, to be ambassadors of heaven. Uh, he's called us all to be a witness uh, unto him uh, and he's given us uh, uh, some wonderful seed that we can sow that will have some fruit uh, not only in this life but the life to come. Uh, but if you're ever going to do anything for God, uh, it's going to take work. Uh, you ever wonder why there are some churches uh, that sit around and do nothing? Uh, it's because they're doing nothing. Uh, uh, listen, the Lord uh, honors work. Uh, the Lord honors a church that gets the gospel out. Uh, the Lord honors a church that gives the missions, uh, that gets the gospel out into the world. Uh, and the Lord honors uh, a church uh, that seeks uh, to please Him and to do something. Uh, you show me a busy Christian I'll show you a happy Christian uh, you show me a Christian that works uh, 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 for a heavenly means uh, and I'll show you a blessed Christian uh, you show me a Christian uh, that just takes and takes and takes uh, and never gets involved and does anything uh, I'll show you a shallow Christian uh, and I'll show you a Christian that don't have the blessings of God in his life uh, mm, can I say anything worth having takes work we can look at the welfare system of America and realize uh, given, 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 given does not produce good results. Because if it's not earned, uh, it's not appreciated. But when you work for it and you labor for it and you hunger for it and you task after it uh, and you take care of it, uh, my dear friends, you're proud of it and you have something that you can appreciate uh, because of the blessings of God honoring your work. Uh, so we see the work. Now notice the word. Uh, uh, the man sowed good seed. Notice it didn't just say he sowed seed. He sowed good seed. There's all kinds of seed out there. There's only one good seed. The word of God is the good seed. Uh, it's the acceptable seed. Uh, it's the one that's God breathed. Uh, it's the one that's God anointed. Uh, it's the one that's promised to never return void. Uh, it's the promise to, uh, to perform that which uh, uh, God willeth. Uh, uh, we need good seed. Uh, there's too much false seed. Uh, there's too much bad seed. Uh, there's too much uh, 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 seed that's been compromised. Uh, and my dear friends, the only thing that's going to help people and the only thing going to bring eternal fruit is good seed. And that's the word of God. God. Uh, so we see the work. We see the word. Uh, then we see the world. Look what it says. Uh, he sowed good seed in his field. And we see the world. Now, our field is Florence, Kentucky, Hebron, Kentucky, Burlington, Kentucky, Union, Kentucky, Erlanger, Kentucky. That's our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And then there's the utmost part of the world. That's the part we can't get to. And that's why we support all them missionaries. Because uh, they can take the gospel where we cannot go. Uh, God's called them to go there. That's why we invest in them uh, to take the good seed uh, into the fields uh, that uh, 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 we'll see a harvest. Uh, uh, the Lord said, uh, hey, uh, 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 the fields are wide unto harvest, but the labors are few. Uh, there's nowhere in the regions of the world you won't find somebody. Uh, there's a harvest waiting. Uh, they just need some good seed and some workers uh, uh, to bring forth fruit. Uh, so we see the world... Uh, but then I want you to notice the wearied. Look at verse number 25. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept. Can I say, when you work, you're subject to get tired. When you work hard, you'll get exhausted. The Bible tells us not to be weary in well-doing. Sometimes you can even overdo it in working for the Lord. In Mark chapter 6, we find after his, his, Jesus had sent his disciples out two by two, when they came back and gave report, he said, come ye into a desert place and rest for a while. You can actually uh, overdo it. That's why I get real concerned. We've got some folks right now in our church that's doing double and triple duty. Mm, we got some that's not doing anything. And it's a sad, sad day when there's so much work to do and there's some who's not pulling their weight. But can I say, when you get wearied, you're subject to go to sleep. 
Well, can I say, it's one thing to get weary in well-doing, it's another thing to get weary in doing nothing. And this crowd just went to sleep. You know what's wrong with a lot of our churches? Folks sitting in church pews asleep. And they're going to sleep on the job. It's a dangerous thing to go to sleep on the job. What if your job's driving a truck? You're putting other people's lives in danger. When you go to sleep on the job, the Lord's work, you're putting people's lives in danger. In danger of dying and going to hell. Well, these folks slept. And they slept because they become slothful. When folks go to sleep in the Lord's work, it's because they get to the point where they don't see the importance of the Lord's work anymore. Get slothful. Well, somebody else will pick up the slack. Well, the Lord saved you to carry your own load. Hmm? They become slothful. They become sluggish. Just watch people come to church. Some drag in here like a bunch of slugs. I'm not talking about coming in at 7 o'clock. I'm talking about the way they come in. Some, it's all they can do to get off work and get here on time. But there are some they drag in like they'd rather be anywhere else in the world than here. They're going to sleep and don't even know it. They're slothful. They're sluggish. People go to sleep because they become satisfied. Well, I'm saved. My family's saved. That's good enough. It wasn't good enough for Jesus. It's his will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the prophet Amos said in chapter 6, verse number 12, Woe unto him that is at ease in Zion. It's a terrible thing to become satisfied with what you've done for the Lord. You know why there's no retirement in the work of the Lord? Because we're never to be satisfied until he's satisfied, and he becomes satisfied when he takes us home to glory and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, we ought to never be satisfied that we've done enough. Not until every t uh, stone's been overturned. Uh, not until every sinner's uh, been shared the gospel. Uh, not until everybody's given an opportunity to repent. Uh, we ought to never, ever be satisfied. Uh, if they don't repent, uh, tell them again. Uh, and show them again. Uh, and tell them again. Uh, because how many times did Jesus have to tell you before you got saved, huh? But see, they got wearied. A lot of folks are wearied. You know why we're wearied? because we're investing in things that's not the Lord's work. Sunday's the Lord's day. It's a day of rest. Well, we need a day of rest because half, half the folks stay up all night Saturday night uh, watching the idiot box and you come in with the TV hangover. You don't do that Sunday night because you know you got to get up and go to work on Monday. You got to Mm, go to bed praying and get up excited and get, get uh, all ready to come to the house of God. You ought to get here early and pray and you ought to uh, greet folks when they come in and you ought to have a, uh, just an uh, excited attitude uh, that's infectious and everybody else wants what you got. Uh, uh, but we don't do that. We drag in. Because we did so much on Saturday that we're wore out for the Lord's day. You're welcome. Didn't cost you anything. I ain't even preaching yet. We see the work, we see the word, we see the world, we see the wearied. And now notice the wicked one in verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came. You know when the devil shows up when we're asleep? When we're not on guard? Why do you think Peter warned us by saying, Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. He said, Be on guard, be alert, don't go to sleep, because when you do, Slowfoot's going to show up. Notice the enemy didn't show up while they were awake, while they were alert, while they were sober. He showed up while they were sleeping, while they were. You know what I found? You know when the devil puts a wolf in sheep's clothing in the church? When the church hadn't seen any fruit in a while. 
because they're all weary and gone to sleep, wondering what's going on, wish the preacher would start preaching better so we get some more people coming in. Then all of a sudden the devil puts put somebody in, everybody's so excited to see a visitor that they'll uh, uh, open up the keys and give them everything. The wicked one showed up when they went to sleep. Now notice the weeds. It said, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. He put some weeds in with the wheat. Of course, the wheat is the fruit of the labor. And then we find some weeds that show up in the midst. And can I say... I would to God that everybody came to church, was saved, and came for the right motive and the right reason and came to worship the Lord. But don't be a fool. There's goats amongst the sheep. There's tares amongst the wheat. The enemy works a whole lot harder than we work. Hmm? It blows my mind after the message we heard Sunday morning. I'd have broke my neck to be here Sunday night after that message. Now, where were they? Saying, Preacher, are they saved? I can't, I can't tell you. There's only one person in this building that I know is saved. That's me, because I was there when it happened. Now, I see some fruit in some other people's lives. But whether or not you're saved is between you and the Lord. But I'm here to tell you, I sure wouldn't want anybody questioning whether or not I was saved or not. I'd want to show them that I was saved, huh? James says, uh, 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 I'll show you my faith by my works. Hmm? But I'd broke my neck to be here after that message Sunday morning. I'd want everybody to know I love my master. Maybe they were saying how much they loved their master. Hmm? Huh? I'm reminded in chapter 7 of the book of Matthew, there are going to be many that come to the Lord at the great white throne judgment and say, didn't we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we not do many wonderful works in your name? And he says, depart from me, ye that worked in iniquity. I never knew you. Huh? Another place he told him, he said, ye are of your father the devil. Maybe they are loving their master. Just saying. We see the weeds. Notice the worry. Verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants uh, said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Now, these folks are worried. They have a very legitimate concern. They understand that they planted good seed so they'd grow wheat, and they needed wheat in order to have their substance and their living when harvest time came. And the last thing they wanted was a bunch of tares with the wheat. And they said, shouldn't we go out and get rid of those tares now? He said, no, unless you tear up some of the wheat. You see, it's very, very... Uh, fragile you got to have a very keen balance you can't make up your mind who you think's a tear and who you think's wheat and go trying to extract the tear you might be tearing up some wheat there's a concern Amen. we want to see good fruit from good seed but you better be careful about judging what's a wheat and a tear you know what they tell me the only t way you can really tell the difference is at harvest time when the hole's broken up. Mm. True wheat has the germ of wheat. A tear's empty. But you don't know till harvest time. Hey, I got, I got good news for you. When the Lord calls his children home, he knows who those that are his. There are those, as Paul told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that have a form of godliness. They deny the power thereof. They look the part, but they're empty on the inside. They have a form. Uh, notice the wisdom of the field owner. He says in verse number 29, 
But he said, nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. We don't, we don't want to do that. Let's use some wisdom on this thing. Now, I say it this way. You just take care of the wheat, the tares take care of themselves. I heard an old preacher years ago said he, had, he grew up in Texas. They had a lot of horses. He said, with horses, you get a lot of manure. You take care of the horse, the manure take care of itself. I've learned you just take care of the horse. Manure take care of itself. A lot of preachers get burnt out because they're too busy spending too much time in the manure. Guess what happens when you spend time in the manure? You come out smelling like manure. Just take care of the horse. Hmm? I made up my mind years ago if the Holy Ghost can't get people to church I'm not going to pull my hair out trying to get people to come uh, if the Holy Ghost can't get them here what, all I'm doing is just beating a, beating a dead horse uh, I'm going to take care of the horse then notice if you will the warning though look at verse number 30 let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Notice he takes care of the tares first. If you study scripture, Revelation chapter 20 is the great white throne judgment. And that's where the dead and wicked dead will be cast into the lake of fire. Guess when we get New Jerusalem? Revelation chapter number 21. Hmm? God's word always just falls in line with God's word. But notice he said, bind the tares together. Isn't it amazing in the ecumenical movement that started about 30 years ago, they started saying, let's lay aside all doctrinal differences and come together in the name of Jesus. Isn't it amazing what binds people together? A false Bible, a false belief, a false sense of worship, a false spirit, that binds them together, and that's what's going to send them to the fire. If they're wheat, they don't need to be bound to anything. They just belong to Him. Yeah. Hmm? But what I want to focus on tonight, I want to focus on verse 25, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Here's the wheat, the fruit of the labor. Here's the real deal, the wheat. And there's a bunch of weeds growing all around it. I want to preach with God's help tonight on this thought. I want to preach on weedy Christians. Weedy Christians. If you're not careful, you'll hang out with the weeds so much, the weeds will start affecting you. Mm-mm. Can I say some things about weedy Christians tonight? And really, I hope some of the weedy Christians are watching via live stream tonight. Mm, this might help you. Because you need to be in the vineyard God planted you. Mm, just because we have that convenient uh, measure to watch our service, you ought to be in the house of God unless you're providentially hindered. Uh, that was never intended for folks to sit at home and watch the service. And by the way, you can't sit at home and get what God's doing here. Hmm? But let me give you some things about some weedy Christians. Can I say, first of all, weedy Christians are choked. Look at verse number 7 of chapter 13. Talking about seed and talking about the soil that it's planted in. It says in verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Look at verse 22, the explanation of that parable. It says in verse 22, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Weedy Christians have been choked by weeds uh, and they are now unfruitful. Uh, they are not doing what God intended them to do. In John chapter number 15, we find the Lord said, It is ordained of God that we bring forth 
much fruit. Uh, if you've been saved by the good grace of God, uh, if your sins have been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Spirit of God has sealed you unto the day of redemption. Uh, you've been bought with a price. Uh, your life is no longer your own. Uh, and it's the intention of God to work in you and through you of His good will and good pleasure. Uh, it is God's will uh, that you and I that are saved by the grace of God uh, bring forth much fruit uh, unto the honor and praise and glory of our Savior uh, who died for us, uh, who saved us, uh, who's going to take us home to glory. Uh, and when he looks at you and I, uh, he desires to see fruit. Amen. But weedy Christians, their fruit is being stymied by the weeds that are choking them. Can I say? Some are choked by the cares of silver. Verse 22 said the deceitfulness of riches. There are some Christians that are breaking their neck to earn every penny, every dime that they can, and all the while they're earning stuff that does not matter because I promise you in a hundred years from now it's all going to burn up. Heaven and earth's going to melt away. All those things that we've laid up treasure on the other side is going to last forever. And they're breaking their neck trying to earn a buck, trying to put back a little. I'd rather have a whole lot of God and little in my pocket than have the whole world and let people die and go to hell around me. Can I say some of the most Christ miserable Christians I know are Christians that have money in the bank. Some of the happiest Christians I know don't have much in this world's goods, uh, but they live by faith uh, and they do all they can to honor the Lord. Uh, I know people, as we sit here tonight, members of our church that have tens of thousands of dollars in their checking account and they're miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. Go read Revelation chapter number 3 uh, and you'll find them in the Laodicean church. Uh, they think they have need of nothing uh, and they're choked and miserable by the deceitfulness of riches. Money can't buy happiness and money can't buy the power and the presence of God in your life. Why do you think the Lord said it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the gates of hell? Uh, because the love of money is the root of all evil. And can I say, they're choked by riches. Mm. I'd rather be in debt up to my eyeballs and have Jesus yeah. than have everything in the world paid for and miserable. Yeah. Mm. They're choked by riches, by silver. They're choked by their schedules. It amazes me how people got time for everything but Jesus. Mm. It amazes me they never miss the job, they never miss the ball fields, they never miss everything, but they miss church. They're weedy Christians. Their schedules dictate mm, the power of God in their life. Listen to me. I've been way too lax on this. And you stick around, neighbor, because the laxness is about ready to be tightened up. To be providentially hindered means it is out of your control. If you uh, 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 have a physical condition that you cannot get to church, God understands that. Uh, if you have a, a situation on the job where you can't miss work uh, uh, to come to church, God understands that. Uh, but when you elect uh, to miss week in and week out and service after service after service, uh, God don't understand that. Uh, God don't approve that. Uh, and listen to me, God's not pleased with that. Uh, and you're choking the life of God out of your life and you don't even see it. Amen. They choke themselves with schedules. There ought to never be a question who comes first. And of course, we heard that Sunday morning. Do you love your master? The Lord Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But he also said to that crowd that said they loved him, the same that he, that he told Isaiah and Ezekiel to tell them in their days. With your lips you do honor me, but your heart is far from me. There's a lot of people that come to church, but their heart's not here. They're choked by the cares of silver, choked by the cares of schedules. Some are choked by the cares of sorrows. 
Glendale and Dougie's most infamous ever plays when them and Thaddeus did A Man of Constant Sorrows. It was one for the ages. That was the best one we ever did, wasn't it, Ray? What is that? For 20 years, we've tried to live up to that standard, but we've just placed the bar too high with that one. Uh, but can I say there are Christians that live their life in constant sorrow? Listen, I can be sympathetic of the fact that your heart's been broken. I be, can be sympathetic of the fact that you have faced hardship and storms. But just because you face them don't mean that they ought to control your life. Miss Tammy and Brother Stephen sing that song, When waves are over your head, they're under his feet. Your sorrows and your storms do not have to control you. The Bible says, Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, you can have victory over your sorrow. Uh, you can have joy unspeakable, full of glory in the midst of your grief. Uh, if you put Jesus first in your life, uh, it says he has a peace that passeth all understanding. Those that live in constant sorrow choose to live in constant sorrow because they're choked by the weed of that sorrow. Can I say some are choked by the cares of sickness? I done said there are some people sick that can't come to church. But there are also some who talk themselves into being sick. I don't understand how a runny nose from a child keeps a whole family out. I have yet to figure that out. And if I can be real honest, you can ask my wife. I've been sicker than a dog since about 3 o'clock this morning. In body, I feel terrible tonight. Say, why are you here? Well, I've been feeling terrible at the house. Why not come to the house of God and do what I'm supposed to do? The Lord's been kind of helping me while I'm preaching. Amen. I found any time I come to the house of God when I don't feel good, I always feel better once I get here. Amen. I'm not talking about when you got something that other people can catch. I'm just talking about when you don't feel good. Hey, 99% of the time after you hit 40 you don't feel good something's hurting and after you hit 50 you don't even remember what's hurting but something's hurting but there's some people that talk themselves into being sick because it's convenient because the weeds have choked them we actually have people that are members of our church Let's say they have an anxiety disorder and they can't come to church because they're afraid of a crowd, but they go to Cracker Barrel where you got to stand in line to get in the place. They wear Walmart out. I would to God we had as many people here tonight as Walmart's got. Uh, I'll take half of their parking lot full. Are you listening? But I just get a little nervous around crowd. No, maybe get a little nervous around the Holy Ghost of God. Weedy Christians talk themselves into being sick. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Your mind can manipulate you to make you believe anything you want to believe. Hmm? All you got to do is go up to somebody and say, you look a little pale. Do you feel warm? They'll talk themselves into having cancer before the service is over. Well, I am feeling a little rough today. It's been a little rough. And then they'll go and say, do I look pale? Maybe you just need to get out in the sun on a sunny day. Some are choked by the cares of silver, by the schedules, by sorrows, by sickness, and others are choked by social issues. I found that people is, are they're controlled from everything from the news to nosiness in this day and age. You know what would be a good day in your life? Turn off the stinking news. Amen. You just have a bunch of talking points and all they try to do is keep your bowels in an uproar. They're all a bunch of liars. They're just trying to get ratings. Uh, be a good day. You just turn off the news. 
The weatherman lies to you. They only give you about 30 seconds sports. Click over to ESPN, get all the sports you can use. Uh, uh, they, they don't tell you nothing you need anyway. They just tell you about somebody getting shot and somebody getting robbed. Uh, boy, that'll really lift your spirit. Uh, hey, just turn off the news. And then, if the social news isn't good enough, you got social media. You're so nosy, you got to know about everybody else. I watch people. I watch them. They get in the cars. First thing they do, they're on their phones. Isn't it amazing? We have people in the church that don't know the well, names of new church members who've been here for a year, but they know everything about everybody's business. I've had them come up and say, Now, what's their name? Where you been? I've been coming for six months. You want to have friends? Show yourself friendly. By the way, this is Sarah Smiles, okay? She's Melissa's daughter, huh? Melissa's known her all her life, okay? In case you need that, huh? But you'll look her up on Facebook. You'll know where she works, how much money she makes, what size shoes she wears, and when she went to the bathroom last. I'm so proud of you. Huh? People are controlled by their phones. I've been really praying about God. Let me call another fast from that stuff. Boy, we was rolling good when people gave up their TVs. Uh, they gave up their social media. Boy, didn't you do wonderful things, God, when people quit being choked by the weeds uh, uh, that are controlling their lives? Uh, hey, uh, weedy Christians are getting the life of God choked out of them, out of them by that junk. If we mandated everybody had to throw their phones in a safe and keep them locked up for a month, some of you would pout and draw up and die. You got to have that Facebook and that social. As much as I preached on that, and you, just, you still, you got to have, you know why you're addicted to it? It controls your life. You're a sad excuse of a human being if you allow being nosy from somebody else's bathroom habits control your life. You are. Life is more important than noticing somebody else's business. Go study the Bible. Talks about being busy by it, bodies. Huh? Talks about being uh, talking behind people's backs. Huh? It talks about all that stuff, and it controls you. Shame on you. No wonder you don't have any touch of God in your life. Weedy Christians are choked. That's point number one. Point number two. Weedy Christians are compromised. Listen, weeds rob plants of nutrients, water, and sunlight. When you are wrapped up by the weeds of this world, it compromises you as a Christian. You don't get the nutrients that you need in your Christian life. You don't get the water, the Holy Ghost, and the water, the Word of God, and you don't have the light of the Lord Jesus Christ shining on you the way He desires to. Listen to me. Plants will feed on something, uh, and weedy Christians uh, are feeding on weed excrements, uh, and it's killing your life. Uh, you're feasting on things of this world, and you're worldly, and you don't even know it. Because all the weeds are telling you how wonderful you are. You compromise. I said, a, a terror looks just like the wheat. And you're hanging out with weeds and you're looking like them and you're acting like them and you're talking like them and you're smelling like them and you're sounding like them. You're a weedy Christian. They preach, I'm saved. Well, if you've got to talk people into it, you're a sorry excuse of a Christian. You ought to stand out from the weeds. I can take you in my yard right now and show you every dandelion, every batch of crabgrass, and every Af wild African violin in my yard because they stand out different from the plants. Uh, Miss Annette put out some trees today. She put out some plants this week. Uh, some of the plants she put out last year, they're starting to bloom. There's a difference between something that blooms uh, and something that's a weed, my dear friends. The only way you get rid of the weeds is to extract them. Some of you are growing up with the weeds and it doesn't bother you. Weedy Christians are choked. They're compromised. Weedy Christians are contemporary. 
because a weedy Christian doesn't have any problem looking and sounding like the weeds. Can I say we at the Emmanuel Baptist Church proudly proclaim that we are independent we are not unified with any other church. We stand independently uh, and give an account to our head, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, we do not get anybody else's permission uh, to serve the Lord. We serve him according to his word. And we're also fundamental. That means we base everything we believe on what Jesus says. We are not contemporary in any way, shape, or form. If it looks like a duck, if it quacks, if it has webbed feet, if it has feathers, uh, it's a duck. Uh, if it looks like the world, if it sounds like the world, if it smells like the world, it's of the world. Uh, Jesus said, come ye apart and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Uh, we're to look different, uh, sound different, uh, act different, uh, and be different. Because uh, we have a different father than this world. Uh, and we should exemplify him. Uh, told you all when my children were little I took them to the mall and I said you ever come home looking like that or can you ever come home smelling like that or come, or come home acting like that you're going to have a bad day because you're a foster you're not that Amen. can I say we carry his name we call ourselves Christian live Amen. up to your name yes. we're not contemporary but we Christians are we Christians have Philosophies like this. Well, at least they're going to church somewhere. If they're not going to a Bible believing, Bible preaching church, it's more dangerous going to a church somewhere than it is uh, sitting at home getting high. Because uh, when they're sitting home getting high, they know they're sinning. Uh, uh, when they go in to ease their conscience because they got a little sermonette uh, and they told them that every day's a Friday uh, and something good's going to happen to them. Uh, they've been made twofold the child of hell. Uh, now you got to get them lost before you get them saved. Uh, hey, and Satan has blinded three generations just going to church somewhere. We're not contemporary. We're Christian. We believe in practicing biblical holiness so people can see the difference. But weedy Christians are contemporary. Weedy Christians don't have any problem taking a social drink. Biblical Christians do. Weedy Christians don't have any problem looking and smelling like the world. Biblical Christians do. Weedy Christians don't have any problem with music that sounds like the world and calling itself Christian. Biblical Christians do. The Bible says, speaking of yourselves in hymns, uh, we have a whole book of the hymns, uh, 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 psalms, uh, uh, we got a whole uh, 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 book of the psalms, uh, and spiritual songs, uh, making mentally uh, uh, the Lord in your hearts. Uh, I've yet to hear a contemporary Christian song that had any spiritual juice on it. It's contemporary. If the vineyard likes it, we hate it. If Crossroads embraces it, we run from it. If they got to have a concert in an arena big enough for a ball game uh, uh, so folks can come out and pay for it, we're not interested. Uh, I'd rather have somebody couldn't carry it in the bucket to get up and sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, uh, have God all over it and have a crowd. Uh, weedy Christians are contemporary. Weedy Christians are contrary. They always seem to find any reason or excuse not to fulfill their obligations and they'll justify their actions at all cost. Well, that's just Brother Doug's opinion. Well, one day you're going to stand for Jesus. Then what's your excuse going to hold? Hmm? You're contrary. Can I help you something? Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Sheep follow. Goats, but 
But, Brother Doug, you're so narrow-minded. Yeah, because that's a narrow book. But, Brother Doug, uh, if we just loosened up right here, we'd have more weeds. But, Brother Doug, if you just, just relax a little bit, now I've seen what happens when you go to sleep. Amen. Hey. Huh? Goats, but, but, Brother Doug, if you knew I, I got to work all day and I'm too tired to come to church, uh, well, you've got a real problem. Why don't you go to bed a little bit earlier uh, so you won't be so tired so you can come to church? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. You know what sheep do? Sheep say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, you want to go that way? I'm right behind you. Lord, that's what you want to do? Hallelujah, I'm right there. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Sheep show forth their wheat. Goats. Or weedy Christians act like goats because that's all I do is hang around goats. Huh? I don't know where it came into society that you have 35 and 40 year old mamas try to relive their youth through their teenage daughters and you got mamas trying to act like their teenage daughter's sisters instead of being mamas but it's filtered into the church well we just need to fit in with the world and just rebel a little bit and do little this little that God will understand no he don't understand he said be a holy for I am holy they're always contrary. They're always bucking society. They're always bucking the Bible. Huh? No matter what you preach in this Bible, they'll find something to be contrary, cross with, and they buck, the, they buck it. Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I don't care what the preacher says. I'm going to do this. You might want to check up. Your heart might not be what you think is in there. Let me say this last about weedy Christians. They're carnal. See, they got weedy because they became complacent. They just got to where they was just going through the motions, let the weeds grow up all around them, and the weeds got so thick on them, they just became carnal. You know what's a sad commentary? The people that we've had come through this church, and they let the weeds choke them so much that now they're out in sin and you wouldn't even know they's a Christian. There's been men stand behind this pulpit and open this book and tell you how to live and tonight they're living carnally. Because of the weeds. They got choked. And then they became a little contemporary and a little compromised and a little contrary and now tonight they're carnal. And they'll sit there and justify being carnal. You see, they spend so much time with the weeds, they start acting like them. Amen. I said, all that say this, weedy Christians fail to see how their fruit is compromised until it's too late. The Bible said, no man lives unto himself, no man dies unto himself. The Bible says we are written epistles known and read of all men. There are people watching your life and watching my life. But see, what happens is those men that have stood behind this desk, they, they're carnal tonight, but they don't see how it's affecting their children and their grandchildren. See, the whole time you're being weedy and carnal and contrary and all those things, you've got little Johnny, little Susan coming right up behind you. They see you don't respect the things of God. Why should they? And see, when you've got to go bail them out of jail and your heart's broke, who do you think led them down that path? You did. Because you was contrary. And you compromised. And you started looking like the weeds and acting like the weeds. Hmm. Homes get broke up because people quit taking the things of God seriously. Children, grandchildren out living carnally because mom and dad sitting in the church house living carnally on the church pew. Weeds all engrafted in their lives. 
Verse number 30, it says, Bind the weeds and throw them in the fire. You know what is the terrible indictment of our day, Brother Clint? Christians say, well, I'm saved and that's all that matters. When they're standing before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ and they look into his eyes as flames of fire, that, that excuse is going right out the window. They wish they would have done more. They wish they would have listened. They wish they would have ran from the weeds. Tonight the church house should be full. It's half empty. Because of weeds. And excuses. And lameness. It affects our service tonight. But it will affect that person's life for all of eternity. How terrible for somebody to live a life contrary and compromising and contemporary only to watch their children to be cast into the lake of fire. Only to watch their grandchildren be cast into the lake of fire. Oh, you might not care tonight. But there's a day you will. You ought to run from the weeds and run to the master. You ought to ask the master to prune you from any weed philosophy in your life. You ought to ask the master to extract that weed from your life. Amen. To extract it from its roots because it has a root of bitterness that will defile you. You need to make up your heart and mind tonight. Sirs, we would see Jesus. Yes. I'm going to put Jesus first. I'm going to put him first till it hurts. Because in the end... It's the best thing I could ever do. I don't want to be a compromiser. I don't want to be contrary. I don't want to be contemporary. I don't want to be choked. I don't want to be carnal. I want to be Christian. That ought to be our attitude. You ought to have so much God on you that the weeds run from you. If there's anything in my life that hurts my testimony, I don't need it. Do you know how many preachers I've had ask me, do you have Facebook? No. Why do you? I got enough keeping up with my emails. And I delete 90% of them without ever opening them. Why are they so involved in all that stuff? Because it fills a void in their life. What needs to fill that void is Jesus. Say, Brother Doug, you can't be that spiritual all the time. Jesus was. And you may not be that spiritual all the time, but you ought to strive for it all the time. See, when you make those kind of excuses, it's because you've been listening to the weeds. The tares will tear you up and tear up your family. What ought to never be said of you is that you're a weedy Christian. May not always be said of you that you're a perfect Christian, but it ought to always be said of you that you strive to be a perfect Christian. And if you just strive to be a perfect Christian, the weeds will never bog you down. The weeds only attach to you when you stop striving and you stand still and be satisfied where you are don't go to sleep now we're right on the horizon Jesus coming Amen. boy I want him to see me striving and thriving and not driving around with the weeds how's your life tonight been a hard message maybe if you'd all been here last Wednesday night I wouldn't have had to preach this hard Maybe if you had all been here and support these other preachers when I, when I was out of town, I wouldn't have had to preach this hard. Maybe if your heart would have been seeking after Jesus, we could have preached on the love of Jesus. You know why we had to preach this way? Because there's some weeds growing amongst the wheat. And it's time. The wheat starts taking its nutrients back. Amen. Taking its water back. Getting in the sunlight more. And shining as fruit under the one. 
who sowed the seed. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. He's picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, you did not give that illustration in the scriptures just because you didn't have anything better to do. It was a stiff warning. Lord, there's a lot of people playing games with church. A lot of people going through the motions. A lot of people's lives are messed and they don't understand why. It's because they've let the weeds intertwine them and corrupt them and carry their thinking to philosophies of the world instead of what this book says. God amazes me that people spend hours a day on a, in front of a computer screen being nosy about other people and they don't even open their Bible to see about you. Now God, I pray you do work here tonight. Do work in me. I don't want to be a weedy Christian. And God, I pray that you'd be glorified. And I pray that, Lord, we'd see a difference in our church because of people truly being Christian. And Lord, not being caught up with the tares. Have your will and way in this invitation. Speak to hearts. Glorify your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.